All right, so I'll be talking um, today about something a little bit different than what's been talked about uh, so far. So I'm currently a, a PhD student at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, UH, um, and I'm uh, doing radiation research. So uh, I'm doing my PhD in physics, and I'm interested in terrestrial gamma ray flashes. So we'll get into what all that uh, is um, later, but I've done about 75 balloon flights um, so far, you know, during my undergrad and master's degree. Um, I launched a lot with uh, Space Hardware Club uh, here at UAH. So um, here's outline of the talk. I'm going to introduce you to the project that um, I've been working on. Uh, and then uh, I will talk about its design. So all of the things that went into it, uh, unique challenges, et cetera, um, and then talk about the flights so far. So um, the project beginnings. So when talking about radiation uh, in the atmosphere, probably the first uh, first thing is a Geiger counter. So a Geiger counter is you know just a very simple tool to measure radiation. Uh, it just measures if a particle has hit the sensor. So it's sort of a yes, no um, sort of deal. So um, back in 2016, um, SHC, uh, uh, including uh, me, built this uh, Geiger counter payload called Fazoon. And so we launched this guy in a whole bunch of different environments. Uh, um, during the day, at night, uh, we also launched it during thunderstorms and during uh, the 2017 solar eclipse. So all of that was uh, very exciting. Um, but what we noticed was when we flew it through thunderstorms, we got uh, very high count rates in the thunderstorm itself. So this is a graph from um, a flight of the Geiger counter through a thunderstorm. And so um, this horizontal axis is time, and then the black is count rate. Um, so you can see during this period here where it was um, more or less at the cloud tops of the storm at around maybe 10 to 11 kilometers altitude, um, we got lots of count rates, lots of counts uh, in the detector. And so we also um, saw this on a second flight. We got this little spike. And this time we were higher up above the storm um, when, we, when we detected it. So uh, this got us interested in sort of uh, quantifying this a bit more and investigating uh, radiation in thunderstorms. So uh, I guess to start off with radiation and thunderstorms, uh, thunderstorms have charge structures. They build up charge uh, because like water droplets and ice particles rub together and exchange charges. And so you'll get these large charge layers in the storm um, that build up charge. And what can happen is electrons get accelerated by this field. Um, and so those electrons are high energy radiation themselves, but then they also create secondary particles, secondary gamma rays um, when they interact with atoms in the atmosphere. And so this is the fundamental mechanism for a high energy radiation like x-rays and gamma rays inside storms are these accelerations from uh, electric fields. Um, and it's quite a, a complicated process. So there's kind of two main uh, things, uh, two main types of uh, phenomenon in storms. There's gamma ray glow, and then there's uh, gamma ray flashes. So a glow can be sustained over a period of minutes, um, several minutes, maybe up to 10 minutes. And what that is, is there's a large scale field in the storm and the electrons are kind of continually being accelerated by that field. And so what you'll happen is you'll have this low level of radiation for, for minutes. Now, um, as you probably uh, could guess, lightning will discharge those uh, layers of charge. So it'll equalize the charge between them. And when that happens, there's lots of accelerations of electrons happening because the field is changing very quickly. And so what you get are these um, gamma ray flashes. 
And so there's, uh, they're very short on the order of milliseconds. You get a huge amount of radiation um, in that short amount of time. So these are kind of the two different types of processes um, in the storm here. Um, now, thunderstorms are kind of complicated. So this can happen in many different parts of the storm um, and at various altitudes. Um, and what we're interested in with um, balloons specifically is getting up close observations of these phenomena. So for example, um, TGFs, the flash part of the gamma ray events, um, have been observed from space and they've also been observed from the ground. And both of those have certain advantages. Like if you're in space, you can cover a wide area um, of the ground to observe. Um, and if you're on the ground, you're decently close to the source itself. The thing about ground-based measurements is you have a lot of atmosphere that this gamma ray flash has to go through. So the benefit of using a balloon is you're right there where the flash is happening or right above the storm. And so there's also a lot that is unknown about the process that creates TGFs. So using balloons, uh, we can narrow down sort of the, the proposed processes that are created uh, that uh, create the TGF itself. So that's why we like to use balloons. Um, they're also cheaper than satellites and you can fly many detectors at once. And that's in fact uh, what we do. So the actual design of the instrumentation itself, uh, we have the radiation detection payload and sort of three subsystems. We have the radiation detector itself, and then we have a data acquisition subsystem which plugs into the detector subsystem. Um, this captures all of the radiation data and saves it to an SD card. And then we have an environmental subsystem which records stuff like pressure, temperature, IMU, and then importantly, GPS, so that we know where we are. Uh, we also have a Raspberry Pi Zero to record uh, 1080p color video uh, facing down from the payload. So uh, briefly, the radiation detector uh, how this kind of works is at the top here, there's a special type of crystal called a scintillator. And when a uh, high energy particle like a gamma ray hits that scintillator, it'll emit visible light. So it will scintillate. And that light will then travel to this part down here called a photomultiplier tube. And it'll take that light and convert it into an electrical current using the photoelectric effect and then lots of uh, acceleration of electrons throughout this tube. So down here you get a current and this piece of technology uh, converts that current into a voltage and then you can measure that voltage with an analog to digital converter or ADC. And so this type of crystal here at the top is very important. Um, there's lots of different types of simulation crystal and they each have different properties. For our payloads, we actually use two different types of crystals um, on various payloads. So we use this crystal called LISO um, and then a second crystal called CLIC. So both of them have various advantages which I'll uh, get to when you actually see the data. So as far as the other things on our radiation detection payload, uh, this is the uh, FPGA development board that we used. Um, it's a DE10 standard. So uh, this big board here contains an FPGA and also an SD card slot that saves all the data. And this board on the right is uh, the analog to digital converter. So this takes in our signal and converts it to digital measurements at 150 uh, mega samples per second. So it's a pretty fast ADC for the size and weight that it is. Um, and there's two of them. So um, that's pretty nice. So this is obviously an off the shelf uh, component. Um, but we also have two uh, custom PCBs that we designed on here. We have the power board here, 
So this takes in power from a battery pack and then uh, branches it out to the 12 volts needed for this, the five volts needed for the Raspberry Pi and the 3.3 volts needed for the environmental board. So the environmental board contains uh, first and foremost, a GPS module, classic uh, U-blocks um, chip. And this provides us with both position measurement and it provides us with exact timing. So these, uh, the pulse per second signals of the GPS are routed to the FPGA board. And so the FPGA board can know exactly when it's detecting the radiation that it detects. Um, and then finally, we have a Raspberry Pi here with a nice uh, Raspberry camera. Um, this works very well. Um, it is, it's nice to have your batteries on one uh, side of the styrofoam and then to have the electronics on the other side. Um, for example, GoPros really like to, to freeze up if you don't shield them properly. But this Raspberry Pi is, is very cheap and it works uh, very well. So we've been using that on our flights, on our payloads. And so here are the finished payloads basically that, that we've built. Um, you can see we've made four of them. And uh, to date, uh, I am now assembling a sixth one. Um, but yeah, on the right, you can see one in uh, flight configuration there. And then uh, we actually have two instruments on the Helen flight line. We sometimes attach uh, what are called electric field meters. And you can see four of them in my background here. And what they do is they have two metal spheres and they spin around, as you can see on the right. It's probably pretty framey on Zoom, but um, they spin around uh, this axis and they can measure the electric field um, as they spin. And the veins also deflect the air so that the entire payload spins around this way. So you can imagine we can sweep out sort of all degrees of electric field. So with this sort of instrument, we can detect both uh, the electric field strength, and then also we can get a direction vector on the electric field. So this is helpful when uh, we try and understand like the charge structure of the storm, or if there are any electric field changes when lightning strikes, for example, um, that could be correlated with a radiation event. So this is a nice secondary payload, which we sometimes add on our flights. So as far as the tracking and parachutes goes, um, spot traces and strato tracks have been invaluable. So we use both um, on each payload line. The spot trace goes inside of the uh, radiation detection payload styrofoam box. And then the strato track is just right on the line uh, above the radiation payload. And uh, we've also been using rocket man shoots. So these payloads are pretty big. They're kind of right at the FAA weight limit of six pounds each. So uh, we need some pretty decent shoots to, to catch them as they fall. These rocket man shoots work extremely well. They open very quickly and uh, we've never had one like descend to the ground at <laughs> terminal velocity um, because the chute didn't open. So, yeah. So this is kind of, uh, as you might expect, the concept of operations. We run our models and say, hey, when a st when's a storm going to be here? Uh, we prep and fill all the balloons, and they go up, and they take measurements over the storm, and then they land uh, in a tree. So this we have to do a lot of, I guess, prior planning for this, because one, we're launching like four balloons at once. Um, and also uh, students have to kind of arrive at a short notice. So there has to be a lot of consideration uh, into when people show up and, and how we can launch and such. So we prep everything in these bins and we make sure the balloons can fit out of the high bay doors because <laughs> um, they're each balloon takes about uh, 600 cubic feet of helium. Um, so like two full 300 cubic foot tanks. So it's it's a lot of helium 
um, a set of four takes, you know, eight full tanks of helium. Uh, also, the data that we gather is sort of too much for radio transmission. So ideally, we would radio transmit at least some of our data, uh, but we decided that the data is really only valuable if we have most of it. So for example, the radiation data is 10 gigabytes, the video data is 40 gigabytes, and then the other data is, is a couple megabytes. But um, I guess you know that's a real challenge, trying to stream 1080p video from a balloon um, might be impossible. So uh, we have to recover the payloads afterwards. And so we have sort of lots of equipment to do so. We have a long pole and a slingshot, which we can use to sling lines and weights over over the payloads, the payload lines in trees. So this is an image of one that landed in a tree. Um, there are also specific sort of unique challenges. So yeah, there's a student volunteer flight crew and it's often a small launch team. So normally we can probably pull this off with about four people. Uh, that's sort of the minimum crew required. Now uh, we have two different regulators that we can use to switch tanks easy. Um, it's, it's very nice to just detach one nozzle and then plug in another nozzle. Uh, it makes stuff a lot faster. Uh, we had practice launches, et cetera, et cetera, checklists and stuff. Um, and yeah, each of these flights, the balloons and the helium and uh, all the accessories for one launch that are not reusable, you know, it's about a thousand dollars, more than a thousand dollars. So we really don't want to uh, screw things up necessarily. Uh, but we'll we'll get to how we did that uh, in the flights. So uh, there are very also unique challenges to do with uh, flying in thunderstorms. So you can uh, fly in either like pop up east storms or sort of a squall line, and they each have their their pros and cons. Uh, so yeah, um, so far we've flown. These are all the flights that we've done. So we had a prototype flight of instruments uh, that we have prototyped. We had a training flight, um, another training flight, and then we had two test flights of a single balloon train. So we had the balloon payload, radiation detector, and EFM, just one line. And so we had two of those flights. And then COVID hit. So we were planning on flying um, in uh, 2020, but uh, because of COVID, university, you know, shut down, et cetera, we couldn't fly. But our first flight was March 17th of 2021. Uh, apparently, we like the 17th of months. Uh, but yeah, we've had five uh, mission flights so far with our instruments. So I'll tell some stories about those flights. Um, so for this flight, the upper level winds were blowing very much to the east. So if we're trying to get above a squall line that's coming in from the west, we can't launch before the storm. Because otherwise, if we launch before the storm, we'll just get blown faster than the storm is traveling. So this was our first launch, and we decided to launch after the main squall line had passed. However, this particular squall line decided to turn from a nice sharp squall line into a giant rain curtain uh, behind it. And so we launched during that rain curtain and the balloons got weighed down a lot. So it was not optimal. Also, the lightning activity was not that great. Um, and in addition, we, we hit Swirl, um, which is the atmospheric science building here at UAH with an electric field meter on, on launch. So not ideal um, conditions. On top of that, none of the radiation detectors worked. So we had tested this rigorously in the past. And actually what it came down to was there was a single check mark, check box um, on an executable that was unchecked for all of them. Um, and you needed to check that to allow that program to execute. And so none of the uh, payloads had that checkbox checkmarked. 
Um, this had to do with like copying the files into Windows and then putting them on sort of the Linux uh, side. And Windows sort of deletes those permissions uh, when you copy various files to it. So unfortunately, nothing, uh, we got no radiation uh, data back. We only got some environmental data and uh, some electric field meter data. And so, yeah, this is a picture of one of the spheres on the roof of the NSSTC here, uh, sitting on one of the awnings. And so we had to go in and fetch that. So when the electric field meter hit, it sheared both metal spheres off of the, off of the instrument. And so one fell on the concrete and one fell on the roof here. Um, but yeah, don't hit buildings with instruments, or at least try not to. Uh, and then also we had some problems. We were using an, an open log SD card writer. And usually they're very good, but uh, we were writing raw data to it. So like raw binary bits to the open log. And it turns out you can put the open log in command mode. And because the, the bits that we're writing are dependent on altitude, uh, it worked perfectly on the ground. It wrote those raw bits to the SD card. But once you got in the air, it started writing different bits to the open log. And so we got lots of corrupted and bad files. And so we had to change the, the package structure that we're actually writing to the SD cards. And storms always come earlier than predicted. We were pretty rushed when we were um, going out there and trying to launch. But yeah, so flight two went much better. So. Uh, we flew during pop-up storms instead of a squall line. And you can see it wasn't really that great of uh, pop-up storms. There was some lightning activity in the area, um, but we got uh, great radiation data. So you guys are probably familiar with a waterfall plot. Um, usually it's like, you know, frequency, uh, but this is, this is energy. So um, which can be the same thing, but this is very high energy. So we're talking sort of 100 keV to maybe 500 keV. We still have to convert um, these energy bins of our measurements to exact energies, but uh, this is time along the x-axis. This is the duration of the flight. And then energy is on the y-axis. And then the color of the cell is obviously the... Um, the number of counts in that small little bin. So uh, here it's on the ground on the left side, and you can tell launch right here because the, the radiation goes down immediately. So on the ground, we're detecting a lot of uh, radon and uranium uh, from the ground, but then right above the ground, there's not much of that. So uh, the counts go way down on launch. But then as you rise throughout the atmosphere, you start picking up cosmic rays um, and cosmic ray secondary particles. And as you get up really high, the cosmic ray secondary particles start to go away. So your radiation is actually going down. So when cosmic rays hit the atmosphere, they interact with air molecules and create lots of different particle showers. So you actually detect the higher quantity of particles lower down in the atmosphere than all the way up here. So this doesn't show altitude, but you can kind of see uh, the time progression of the flight. So right about here is when the balloon bursts and it descends back down through that, uh, that high uh, count layer and then descends under parachute and then lands. So you can kind of see even the spectra difference between sort of on the ground at swirl and then on the ground during the random location where this landed. So it's kind of cool. Also something to point out is there's a there's two bands up here. Um, this band is at the very top is uh, very high energy cosmic rays. So these are rays that dump a lot of energy into the detector. And then this band below it is actually neutrons. So this is a an energy waterfall for the click scintillator material that I mentioned earlier. And what's special about click is it can tell the difference between gamma rays and neutrons. Um, 
And what we realized from this flight was our, our energy gain was a bit high. So ideally we want this band here to kind of come down from the maximum allowable um, limit here of our, our ADC. So um, if this band were to come down, we would get better uh, distinguishment between gamma rays and neutrons. But yeah, lessons learned. Uh, the EFM design breaks on landing. <laughs> so this housing here to contain these spheres is 3D printed. And so uh, three out of the four EFMs that we launched broke on landing. Um, and we can tell they broke on landing by the data that they collected. So uh, we need to we needed to fix those and we needed to set the gains for the detector to be lower. Okay, so flight three. So um, after a couple months uh, had passed between flight one and flight two, um, only a week passed between flight two and flight three. And so for this flight, we just flew the radiation detectors. We didn't fly the RDPs. And well, we underfilled the balloons. We underfilled the latex balloons. Um, and they floated. And one of them went all the way to Oklahoma from, from Huntsville. So this is during the summer. So the, the stratospheric winds are blowing west. And so they floated towards Arkansas. And then one made it all the way to Oklahoma. So like 16 to 20 hours of flight here for these balloons. Um, and we lost one payload in the Arkansas swamp. So this is a picture of it in a tree. So it being a tree is not necessarily a problem. We can get uh, payloads from trees. However, it is in a swamp, which may not necessarily be a problem. We could still recover them from swamps, but this particular swamp is really sinister. Um, it used to be uh, sort of a, a patch of forest in between two farm fields. And so there's large drainage ditches all around the swamp. And what happened is about five years ago, some nice beavers built a dam down the creek and this entire area flooded. So uh, mostly it's probably about like three or four foot deep water, but then sometimes it drops to like 10 or 12 feet on those drainage ditches. And it's also very woody, so you can't get like a boat or anything through there. Um, we were thinking about either getting, you know, using a helicopter or a drone to go get it, but none of those uh, quite materialized um, due to various reasons. But if someone wants to risk their life, which I do not recommend, um, <laughs> there are coordinates of the lost payload. Um, but yeah, that was, that was sad. That was actually the first payload that we lost um, out of sort of eight flights. Uh, and I guess with flight three, that would be 12. So 12 launches and only losing one payload, that's not too bad all things considered. So this is another energy histogram for flight three. And you can see this one's a bit different. Um, the one previously was nice and smooth and you could easily tell where there were radiation counts. This one is a little bit more subtle. So this one uh, is from the LISO detector. So the LISO detector actually should detect TGFs uh, better or higher quality because the pulses that the scintillator gives are much shorter than the click. So you'll be able to distinguish like a lot of pulses really close together, which is important when detecting a terrestrial gamma ray flash. However, the LISO scintillator has uh, a background count. So it itself is radioactive, which is kind of an interesting feature for a device that's supposed to measure radioactivity for it itself to be radioactive. But nevertheless, um, that's what all of this uh, uh, dark red band in here is, is that self count um, due to the radioactive LISO. And so you can see here in the higher energy channels as well, 
um, you can see when it actually get up, gets up to altitude. So you can see here, here's about launch, and then it goes up, and it detects sort of a peak amount of radiation here, and then it goes up past that in altitude. And these guys floated at around 28 kilometers uh, in altitude. Um, and so they floated here until the battery died about eight hours uh, after it got turned on. So um, yeah, so this was floating from Alabama to Arkansas. Uh, and you can see so far, we, I mean, we've tried to fly near storms, but we haven't actually, you haven't actually seen much significant radiation increase or, or anything with these uh, uh, data results so far. Now, lessons learned, uh, don't underfill balloons <laughs> if you don't want them to go long and unpredictable distances. Um, so yeah, so flight three, or it's, flight three was the flight to Arkansas. And about five months after that, uh, we launched uh, flight four. So this was this March, which we launched it. Uh, we launched into a squall line this time. Uh, this time the winds were not quite so fierce, fiercely blowing east, so we had a chance of getting up above the storm. Um, and on launch, we had a balloon blow into a tree, uh, but we had a backup balloon. And you can see here with the, the cool picture on the right um, that we got with uh, the balloon wrangling that had to happen to, to launch these giant balloons in this you know, 30, 40 mile per hour wind. So. Yeah, we you know got a lightning strike in the background. The lightning actually looks uh, closer than it really is. So for these launches, you know, if we detect a lightning strike within five miles, we uh, either if we're outside, you know, we launch the balloon and, and get in. But uh, yeah, if we uh, if there's lightning in the area, we generally don't go outside with a giant balloon. Um, the EFMs. Uh, did a lot better on this flight. They did not break on landing. Um, however, when you're pulling them out of a tree, they do break, unfortunately. So yeah, one payload, uh, blue payload, landed in power lines. So this was video. I mean, I have the full video, um, but uh, this is, these are shots from my camera of my computer screen, so very high quality um, production. But you can see the sparks uh, from the power lines. So this was recorded with the onboard RAS uh, camera. And what we think happened was the Stratotrack antenna bridged to the high voltage power lines. And talking to the people in the house that were right next to, to that, you know, they, they thought that, uh, that Russia had nuked them uh, or something like that. This was in the middle of nowhere. So, I mean, Russia probably definitely would not have <laughs> nuked that place. But anyway, uh, it was a loud bang and then they lost power. Um, so that was interesting. Um, they got power back um, probably within 30 minutes. So it wasn't a huge deal, uh, but yeah, they collected the payload and called our number and we went to pick it up and you're presented with this nice dramatic footage. Uh, and then one of the other payloads uh, landed near Hell Hole, Tennessee. So in the middle of woods. And so we had a good time over the course of many weeks uh, trying to get that down out of a tree. So, but it is kind of funny that it landed near Hell Hole, Tennessee. So data from flight four. So we actually detected uh, increases in, in radiation. So this is from payload four. So we launched them one, two, three, four. So payload four actually launched closest to the storm. And so uh, this was detected uh, after launch. And I can go to the next slide. So we have two channels uh, of our payload, sort of a high energy channel and a lower energy channel. This is the lower energy channel. And you can see this uh, interesting uh, curve of, of radiation here. So we're still analyzing all of this data, um, but uh, it is uh, 
kind of cool to to see something like this. Uh, and so one might ask, okay, what altitude was that in? So this is a waterfall plot, but it's uh, altitude now on the x-axis. So you can see that the the energy increase was detected at around four kilometers. And so this payload uh, went basically right into the storm uh, and we detected a, an increase in radiation here. So this is most likely probably gamma ray glow. Um, and at the time we might've thought it was some instrumentation effect due to the electric fields in the storm causing us to sporadically detect radiation, um, but we think it's it's actually uh, radiation events. So lessons learned, squall lines are difficult to get over. So three of the payloads that we launched basically went ahead of the storm and didn't really engage with the storm. They didn't like get pulled over the storm or anything like that. And then the fourth payload kind of just went right into the storm. Um, you can see due to water logging, it only made it up to like 15 kilometers or so. So not too high of an altitude. Um, so squall lines are pretty difficult. And also watch out for trees. We lost a, uh, a balloon to trees <laughs> in, due to the high winds here. So that's flight four. So one more flight left. And this is flight five. And we flew this about a month ago on June 17th. And so we flew in a very nice, very lightning-y pop-up storms over Huntsville. And it was a very hot day. And uh, we left the spot trackers out uh, in the grass to get locks and to verify that they had tracking. And that was a mistake because it was 99 degrees Fahrenheit out and it was probably, you know, 140, 150 inside these nice black boxes that were on the ground in the grass. And so what happened was um, all of these batteries were freshly replaced too. What happened was we, we put the trackers on the payloads and we launched them and we got one movement alert that said, oh no, the battery is low. And this was for all of them. Um, and then the next packet we got was a tracking packet. And then we never heard from them again. So none of the spot trace packets, uh, none of the spot traces pinged at all after that. And so we were completely relying on the APRS strato tracks to find these guys. And so, uh, to be honest, the strato tracks did very well, um, all things considered. We almost caught one payload, but sadly it landed sort of half on power lines and then on a fence. So we really couldn't have caught it anyway, but we were like, you know, pretty much this close to it when it was descending under parachute and we could see it as it was coming down. So that was a pretty cool moment of almost catching a payload. Um, one landed in Wheeler Lake, and so we had to go kayaking to go uh, get the payloads. So that was uh, a lot of fun uh, doing that. Um, and they, they float very well. Uh, the instrument worked after landing in the water and no water was in the payload on recovery. So honestly, a water landing is pretty darn better than a difficult tree because you can just you know go kayak out to get it. Uh, unfortunately, oh, and then an interesting one, one payload landed right on Redstone Arsenal airstrip. So literally on the airstrip right next to it um, came down our, uh, our payload. And so we had to contact the, uh, we went to the visitor center and was like, hey, <laughs> we need you guys to get this payload off your runway probably. And so um, they were very nice about it and they sent like the fire department out and got it and they you know said oh you know this is the most interesting thing that has happened this week so it must have been a very boring friday for them and sadly one payload was unaccounted for so this payload went directly into the pop-up cells and what happened was the gps on the strato tracker got fried 
So it was still transmitting APRS data, but it didn't, it wasn't geolocated. <laughs> so we got like the altitude. So we knew the balloon was in the air and then descending, but we never got, um, we never got GPS measurements. Furthermore, on descent, the tracker actually failed to stop transmitting completely. So we couldn't localize it on the ground based on like, you know, you know fox hunt or triangulation or anything. Uh, so we did some predictions and this is the area that it most likely landed in. And you can see that a good chunk of it is on uh, Redstone Arsenal. So anything past zero road this way is on Redstone Arsenal. And these are very bad trees here because those trees probably will not be looked at um, in 15 or 20 years. But, you know, it could have landed in, in any of these locations, but it's probably on the arsenal. So that's what I've been doing for the past couple of weeks is building another one of these payloads uh, to fly. So, Chris? yeah, yeah. That's an ordnance testing area on the arsenal, and uh, I landed a balloon in that very spot about uh, 15 years ago, and it's still in the tree because no one would let me back in there because there's exploded uh, munitions in there. Unexploded. Yeah. Yep. So if it's indeed in that spot, uh, you know, we can probably forget about the payload. Uh, if it landed somewhere in here, it might just be stuck in someone's tree and they'll eventually find it. Or if it landed in these fields here, some ground or like in a cornfield, for example, we might hear about it in a couple months. But um, basically, after some thorough searching, we've uh, discounted the, the payload as, as lost. Um, so interestingly, in this flight, we detected very similar measurements to the measurements in flight uh, flight four. And what's cool about this is for this flight, we actually flew the payloads in reverse order. Uh, usually we sensibly launch one, then two, then three, then four. Um, this time we launched it four, then three, then two, then one. So two and one actually launched closest to the storm. In fact, they launched as the gust front uh, was hitting us. And we see the exact same signature from these payloads as we did from flight four um, at the same altitude as well. So uh, this is measurements from the click payload. And you can see that we decrease the gain here so that the neutrons are much lower than the, the, the ceiling of the energy, which is up here. But notably, we have an increase in counts here. And this is channel A. So there's lots of Weird, lots of interesting and weird things happening here. Um, you can see the different, you know, all the different environments that the payload was in. So here before launch, this is mostly swirl. And then this is right after launch here. And then you can see the, this event at about four kilometers altitude. And then the, the region here is very dynamic in terms of what energies that we, we pick up. And then we finally burst right here. And then we descend back through all of those layers pretty quickly um, down to the ground. And this was the one that actually landed in on Redstone Arsenal airstrip. So you can see uh, when it landed and then when the fire department picked it up uh, with their truck <laughs> and brought it to us. And so, yeah, it's, I don't know, it's just a very uh, interesting that you can see all the different phases of the of the flight. And so importantly, so that was payload two. Payload one also exhibited this energy increase at the identical altitude that payload two did. Um, and you can see that here with this nice uh, increase in spike. And again, down here is the LISO self count. So, uh, so it's a very Interesting that we've uh, detected this. We've probably detected gamma ray glow. And uh, this has been detected before with Geiger counters and um, some scintillators, but we have a pretty detailed uh, high resolution setup here. So um, even if we only detect gamma ray glow and not detect a TGF, uh, you know, we'll definitely be contributing to 
the uh, the space. So, uh, yeah, the lessons learned from flight five is don't leave spot traces out in the sun on the grass on the 99 degree weather day. So, yeah, and this is a picture of uh, Todd McKinney, who's the the next speaker, <laughs> uh, sitting, laying out in the out in the sun there, basking in its warmth. All right, and conclusion in future work, we're going to be flying one to two more times this summer, uh, depending on whether we can get helium, uh, and then also uh, later on in the fall slash this winter, we'll be continuing to analyze the data and writing papers to publish. So importantly, we need to convert this from just the energy uh, in the bin that was measured on the ADC to um, actual KEV and energy. And so that will require a little bit of work because we need to uh, compensate for uh, temperature and, and other effects. But uh, yeah, so that's currently the plan. And that's basically um, me sharing what we're doing down here at UAH, at least a small part of uh, the ballooning stuff that goes on here. So thank you. I have a couple of questions. Yeah, why, go for it. Why wouldn't all of your plots have altitude on the x-axis? On the x-axis? I mean, yeah, we can make the plots uh, do that. If isn't, you Isn't that an issue of interest? Yes, it is very much an issue of interest. Uh, with, uh, with these plots versus time, you can kind of see better the the time progression of the flight. Uh, whereas with the altitude, uh, you can't really see the time progression of the flight. Um, you can only see sort of the altitude of where various events are uh, located. The altitude plot is more scientifically valuable um, than the, the time graphs. Uh, but I don't know, I, I showed the, the time graphs because they look, they look pretty, I think. And the other question is the two events that you saw, one of them seems to be much longer duration than the other one. Could yeah. one of them possibly be a flash as opposed to the glow? Mm -hmm. So uh, each bin here is probably about five seconds long. So uh, a glow will last on the order of minutes, which is pretty consistent with uh, with this. Uh, these bins are a little bit more than five seconds in this plot, probably about 30 seconds. Um, but so each of these is most definitely not a terrestrial gamma ray flash. Um, even this plot um, is probably still a glow. Uh, this, this, this sort of plot will probably not show you a terrestrial gamma ray flash which is kind of interesting and part of the data analysis that we still have left to do. Because there are such, because there are such short events, um, you actually don't get too much total flux from them. Uh, so if you were to plot it in sort of, you know, binning of five seconds, uh, you wouldn't get a high increase in count rate over those five seconds, but you would get a very high increase in that millisecond. And I guess I, I would like to add that um, each event that the detector measures is time tagged, so we don't really we don't really bin our measurements at all. Um, they're time tagged down to uh, plus or minus twenty nanoseconds, and then the timing error on the like GPS synchronization gets us to maybe about one hundred to two hundred nanoseconds of time resolution. So. Uh, we can make, yeah, the actual data analysis of this will, will take a couple months to actually see if we detected any TGFs. We have to do lots of correlations between the payloads and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, but I'd like, yeah, it was cool to show you guys a preview of uh, what we've done. Hi, I posted a question to the chat. Oh. 
All right. What was protected in, okay, that was a question before. Here we go. Could you please describe the signals you are collecting from the radiation detector? Yeah, so uh, in the radiation detector, we, uh, we have the voltage out from the, the, the uh, socket, and that is giving, giving you a raw analog stream of voltage data. And what we do is we digitize that with 150 megasample per second ADC, and then that is piped directly into the FPGA board. So what the FPGA does is it looks at that continuous stream of bits that are digitized from the ADC, and it says, okay, is are these measurements above a certain threshold? And if it is, I'm going to start capturing data. And it captures uh, 32 samples of data on the ADC with 14 bit of resolution on two different channels, um, channel A and channel B. And then it saves all of that data to a buffer. And then also on the FPGA, there it's set up to output those buffers to the MC that is also on the FPGA board. And that MCU takes that data and saves it to an SD card. So this setup is really built to one, capture a large flux of data all at once, and then sort up into a buffer and um, write it to an SD card over time. Because um, it would be impossible to continually save uh, 150 mega samples per second of data. But uh, we can do that for um, a millisecond or two. We can actually capture, you know, 150 um, mega samples per second of data over those couple milliseconds and save it over the course of, you know, maybe 100 milliseconds or so. So, thank you. So, as a yeah. follow up, could you, uh, uh, what does the voltage that you're getting out of the detector represent? And then also, could you uh, uh, talk about the uh, the scintillator crystals and uh, their selectivity, if there is any, and overlap? Yeah, sure. So the voltage pulse that we get out from the detector is a combination of a couple things. One is when the initial radiation particle hits that scintillator crystal, it'll deposit energy over uh, when it interacts with that stimulation crystal throughout its trajectory. So it can either go straight through and deposit some energy in the crystal, or it can be fully absorbed by the crystal and uh, deposit energy that way. And that light that is emitted kind of either goes directly into the PMT or it bounces around the inside of the crystal until it reaches the PMT uh, face. So, uh, that itself creates kind of a, a very, very short pulse, very short, probably a nanosecond or two, depending on the scintillation mechanism itself. Um, and then there's some afterglow for the scintillator um, that occurs over um, a dozen nanoseconds. But after that initial process, uh, the light is converted to electrons via the photoelectric effect on the face of the photomultiplier tube. And so that'll free some electrons in the metal to wander around that metal surface. And so you have an electric field that's applied on that metal surface. And so the electrons get kind of corralled as a stream or a very, very small current. So maybe on the order of um, 10 to 20,000 electrons will be collected at this the face here. And then what the photomultiplier tube does is it cascades those electrons over a series of metal plates at different voltages. And at each stage, um, each electron releases more electrons when it hits the metal plate. And so you'll get sort of an acceleration throughout this photomultiplier tube. And you end up with a, uh, a, a current on the order of uh, maybe hundreds of microamps or uh, a milliamp at the socket. And then what the socket does is it has a, um, a preamp and it converts that current into a voltage pulse that then goes on to be measured by the ADC. So that's kind of the full pipeline of the signal in the detector uh, itself. So there's multiple different shaping constants that happen at each stage. 
So that'll affect the output pulse width and properties that you measure. But the, the height of the pulse um, is uh, mostly linear with respect to the energy that was deposited in the crystal. So what you can do is you can sample the height of that pulse basically, and that'll tell you the energy that was deposited into your scintillator, which is really cool. You can you know, determine the energy of the particle that, that in, uh, interacted with your scintillator. So, um, and then I guess very briefly, uh, the different crystals have different uh, constants of release of that, of the photons. So that's kind of uh, one property to think of. LISO only has one scintillation mechanism. So regardless of the particle that interacts with the crystal itself, it only gives off the same light, the same pulse of light, uh, regardless of the radiation type. And mostly LISO is sensitive to um, gamma rays and electrons. Uh, the alpha particles will have a hard time getting past the uh, this wrapping of the detector here. Uh, so it, it is mostly gamma rays and electrons that it's measuring. Um, it also can pick up neutrons. They'll just look identical to gamma rays and electrons. The click, on the other hand, has two scintillation mechanisms, one for gamma rays and electrons and one for neutrons. So the neutrons will actually give a different pulse shape in our detector, and we can differentiate between those gamma rays and neutrons based on the curve in our detector. And so that gives us a lot more information about uh, what types of particles we're seeing there uh, at altitude. Uh, yeah. All right. And then I think Will had a question. This friend's got his PhD studying electron precipitation. Oh, OK. Cool. Uh, will this detect muons? Uh, yes. This will detect muons. They'll look identical to electrons, basically. So um, in these plots here, most of, uh, maybe not most, but some of these particles here that are detected are muons. We just can't differentiate between uh, the muons and the electrons. Yeah. and. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments? Yeah, and I guess I would like to say I'm doing this for my PhD, but I started this as an undergrad and I was the team lead for this project. And we had um, 10 people who helped with this design and, uh, and flight, so. Um, a lot of the work was was also theirs, but it was a lot of fun managing the team and then uh, continuing on and uh, me taking this as my PhD project, understanding all the ins and outs, and then, of course, uh, flying it was, was lots of fun. What's the cost of the detector? That's a very good question. So um, let me go back to the detector slide. So this detector, the LISO detector, was actually custom made by us. So this is a, uh, a PMT in here and a scintillation crystal. And we literally put the scintillator crystal on the PMT with some like interface gel here and then wrapped it with electrical tape. So you can do this pretty DIY, all things considered. Uh, the crystal, the LISO crystals we bought from eBay, uh, they work very well. Um, and yeah, so this detector, the most expensive part is definitely the socket because that's um, made by Hamamatsu. So it's probably around $500 is uh, this detector with about like $350 of that being the socket itself. Um, now the click detector, uh, we, we custom ordered and uh, we got five of them for around $20,000. So each of these detectors costs about $4,000 each. So about more than four times more uh, than the LISO detector. Uh, because they can distinguish between those gamma rays and neutrons, that makes them 
um, more valuable with the science that we want to investigate. Uh, the LISO actually has better detection properties because the pulse is shorter, so we can get a lot of measurements um, in a row, um, whereas the click has maybe pulse pileup. So you'll basically pile up the radiation pulses, but the click gives us a lot uh, more uh, resolution on what we're actually seeing, whether it's gamma rays or electrons. Uh, and then it also doesn't have a background count, so we get a nice clean profile. Yeah, that's uh, that's neat. So yeah, there are, there are lots of uh, lots of different ways to make these these radiation detectors, um, and you can you can do it for a lot, I guess, a lot cheaper and a lot lower budget than this. Um, we only really needed these like the high power FPGA and the the digital signal processing because we were interested in these very short bursts of of gamma rays and so you need that lots of that power to capture uh that much information in that short amount of time but yeah you can make these easily with with analog analog stuff so 